Welcome to this old house in Hopalong Hollow where we are in the most cheerful room of the house and that would be the kitchen. And one of the reasons my kitchen is so cheerful is because I've painted it yellow. I guess that would be one of the happy colors. So today we're just going to do a little walkabout in this turn of the century Edwardian kitchen is what I consider it to be and take a look at all the things that are so useful. They were useful a hundred years ago and they are still useful today. I believe the house was built between 1900 and 1912. I think 1912 being a pretty accurate date for the house. And I also do not think that this was the original kitchen. The original kitchen is actually where I have my garden room right now. It was actually a dining room so all the cabinets and everything that you see in here at this time they did not exist and we actually turned this into two different rooms because we pulled out a wall making this more of a keeping room than a kitchen so we've got the kitchen section and over there a living area which is really where we spend most of our time especially in the winter so everything you see as far as cabinets and utilities would not have been here. The cupboards look like they've been here for a hundred years because they're rather battered looking and a little bit beat up and scuffed, but that's all purposeful. I actually designed these cabinets by looking at um, historic homes in books and in actual museums making sketches and then I gave them to my brother who's an experienced carpenter and he came in and replicated the cupboards for us. So the painting seems a little scuffed and odd and that's also on purpose because when I did the painting I wanted something bright and cheerful because this house is so many dark rooms but I went with the yellow and I actually did a lot of chalk painting on these cupboards and on the wood and on the beadboard behind it. I love the idea of open cupboards because that's when you get to show off all your beautiful dinnerware, your crocks, your plates, your teapots, and even cooking gear, which is so, can be so beautiful and charming. And being cooking implements can be so beautiful. And one reason I love to use them is because they make me think of my mom. <laughs> she and a grandmother used these sifters, these sort of sifters, and these potato ricers, and these funny little strainers, and this sort of thing. It just gives me a wonderful connection to my family and to the past when homemaking was really, really infinitely important part of life. I like to think that it still is. This being an Edwardian home, it's pretty obvious that this large picture window here in front of the sink is not original to the house. In fact, James actually insisted that we put this in, but I was really against it because there were two small paned glass windows here, which I thought were really charming, but they didn't in let in a lot of light. But in this case, James was right. He put this window in and I am telling you, I couldn't be happier than to be able every day to look out to such a vast area because of the space of this window. So I can look out onto the gardens, I can look into the potager, I can watch the animals out here, I can look into the distance at the rolling hills, and I just can't imagine being here washing these dishes and not being able to look out of a beautiful window. In fact, there goes a little finch. Oh, did you see that? 
Mm, she must be after the sunflowers already. Of course, it also attracts the flies quite a bit. But, you know what? That's life. I love this window. <laughs> it's really the only window in the house that is not original to this place. But actually, it suits the room so beautifully and brings in so much light and helps to make the room so cheerful. Now, the sink itself looks like a cast iron sink, but it's actually a steel sink from the 1930s. Turned out to be the perfect size. It's about five foot long, has two drain boards and two basins. And although we had purchased two other cast iron sinks, which were meant to go here, this one turned out to be ideal for this space. Of course, James made the base for the sink and using some antique table legs. And then, of course, there's plenty of room underneath that sink for hiding ugly plastic bottles and cleaning supplies. Many of you have asked about this stove, and it looks to be an antique stove, but it actually isn't. This is called a Heartland stove. They started making these in the 1980s as reproduction stoves from 1910-1920 style. And this is electric. They also make it in a gas. I love this stove, but at the time when I first saw them in a magazine back in the 1980s, I knew I could never afford a stove like this. They were pretty pricey. But then about 15 years ago, James and I found this one used on Craigslist, sold by a woman who had bought a house in which the stove was in the kitchen. She did not like the old-fashioned look of it and wanted a contemporary new stove. And so she sold this one for a really good price. And I love it, but I do have a lot of problems keeping the chrome, uh, the nickel shined up. It really is difficult to keep this stove in tip-top shape. But nevertheless, I love it. And it's perfect for this Edwardian kitchen. From the early 1800s and onward, stonework crocks were used for preserving fruits, vegetables, jellies, tomatoes, of course. And these are authentic pieces, and I try to use them to store things in, but mostly I just like to look at them. I love the graphics on these Heinz strawberry preserves. <laughs> Those Heinz jugs came in almost every size you can think of. We have them all the way up to like five gallons. Displaying your transferware cups through your beautiful china is really easy in a corner cupboard or an open cupboard. That's why they make it so beautiful. It isn't just beautiful for when you're serving tea or when you're having lunch. It's beautiful to look at when you're in your kitchen or your dining room. And this old cupboard here is simply a corner cupboard. It's an antique corner cupboard. Originally it was painted green and then I got in there and I did a few things to it to make it more appropriate for the kitchen. I love to use corners and put them to their best ability to display. I think that if you watch the cooking videos, you know that um, I actually use all these things. I use the grinders. I would use this apple peeler, but the little blade is missing. And I haven't been able to replace the blade for this apple peeler. I love to use this. But I love these old grinders. And of course we have modern equipment. My husband uses contemporary things when he cooks and he really does most of the cooking. I cook for fun. And when I do cook, I like to use the old vintage implements. It makes me have a connection to the past 
to my mother, my grandmothers, my grandmothers that I never knew. I always love these little nesting hens from the 1930s, and I use them as serving dishes and butter dishes. I don't have a lot of copper. This copper could really use a good polishing right now. Should have done that before the video. That's one thing about copper. It does tarnish pretty quickly and you really have to keep it shined up. But I like cooking with it. I think it's beautiful in any kitchen. And it definitely has the feeling of the past. Open cabinets. Love open cabinets. And crockery, which I think I've collected crockery since I was 18 years old. Because I love coffee as much as I love tea. Collecting coffee grinders is a really interesting way to get started in collecting. In fact, this one here I think my mother gave it to me. Yeah, I think I'm about my 20th birthday. And it's just one of my favorites, this old Acme coffee grinder. It doesn't grind very well. And this one almost makes me think that it was probably in a log cabin or maybe even a wagon train because of the way it, it uh, is mounted on this board here. And I think this is a super old one. This one also doesn't make a very good grind, but this one, this arcade crystal grinder, this grinds a pretty good bean. These are in the kitchen because they're out of the way. They can be mounted on the wall. A little piece of furniture right here definitely was a pantry in someone's kitchen at one point. Anywhere from the 1880s up to 1910, I think. But this is a great and deep pantry. It holds just about everything we need as far as canned goods and flowers and sugar bags and all that sort of thing. So we can keep it well hidden away in a very beautiful cupboard. And up on top of that are my yellower bowls, which I also use quite frequently when I'm baking. Here we are atop the pantry, and when I'm making a display, I like to stick with a theme. And in this case, the theme is cream. Cream and butter and milk and yellowware. So we have several butter churns up here. These two actually work. I've used the glass one before. But the wooden butter churn in the back has a slight crack in which all the milk runs out, so that has to be repaired before I could ever use that. This cow is an old doorstop. This is a butter mold. And old milk bottles. Now the yellower bowls I always put to use. There's only two of them here that I really cannot use because they have a little bit too much crazing and chips inside of them. But yellowware was produced in England and in America between 1830 and 1930. And if you want to know the country of or origin for your yellowware, they say that all you have to do is thump the bowl, and if it thuds, it's from America, and if it rings, it's from England. I think all of mine is from America. I love the yellow because it complements the cupboards, the beadboard on the walls. With yellowware, which is actually green yellowware. And that's also earthenware, and there are a couple pieces in here, as well as some uh, bordello pintiero, which I've had my lunches with, which you've seen before. I love those little grinders. They work great. And this apple peeler is so fantastic. That's from the 1930s. The brown and white stoneware pottery, basically, Whiskey jugs. 
I don't have any use for those as far as anything but display, but I think they're pretty cool. In fact, one of those says, um, it's called the Western Pottery Company in Denver, and that's where I used to live, is it, in Colorado? And that's where I bought that. And then the bean crocks are often made by a place called McCoy, which went into business in 1910 in Roseville, Ohio. And then we have a crock here on the end, which was for preserves. Um, this particular preserves were peas. And you can see the little lid with the wire latch on the top. I just love those. I think they're very useful. My mom has a 1930s restored Frigidaire refrigerator. I'd love to have one of those, but I don't. Even the top of your refrigerator can be used to make beautiful displays and store things that you need to have out of the way, but there's still things that you want people to see because, you know, they're just interesting, lovely, or historical. These are two pieces of my artwork that do hang in the kitchen. And you know, I don't hang a lot of my own artwork in the house, I guess because I'm just so used to looking at it. This is a piece though I will probably always hang because it's one of the favorite pieces I've ever done. I did this quite a long time ago, How Bountiful is the Good Earth. And I often toot the horn of many other artists and authors and illustrators, but this time I might think I'm going to toot my own horn for a change <laughs> because I do make a living as an artist. And so I am going to be showing you this print, which is available, and we'll talk about that later, but this is the um, a print of a painted paper cutting that I did, I think, back in the 1990s, I think. And it has all the things in it that I love. It basically represents the garden, the family, home, and the era in which I am trying to recreate in this kitchen. So, how bountiful is the good earth? I'll talk about that a little later. We first moved into this house. This chimney was covered in plaster, white plaster. I couldn't wait to knock it off and see what was underneath, <laughs> and sure enough, beautiful old bricks. You know, when you live in an old house, you want it to feel like an old house. And brick is one way to definitely bring in that old, old world feeling. So this chimney goes up through to the bathroom upstairs and all the way up to the roof. And it's also exposed in the bathroom. Now where you see this rooster guy up here, there's a hole where a stovepipe must have gone. <clears throat> and I believe there was probably a parlor stove in here. Because as I said before, this was probably a dining room. All the ceilings in this old house are 10 feet tall. So, with the exception of this kitchen, where the ceiling had to be dropped by about a foot. Because above us is a bathroom. And so the plumbing runs right above this ceiling. And the beams were here when we moved in. They were very dark and that is one thing I wanted to paint those as well. They weren't very attractive wood. And then we put the false tin ceiling right here as well. Uh, kind of a light buttercream color which also brightens up the room. This oil painting, this, <laughs> this is a still life and uh, it came from James's mother. I don't know where she got it, but I love it. I just love it. And I never have framed it. I just think it looks grand in this kitchen. Picks up all those pretty colors. This marvelous, huge walnut table. This really takes up a lot of the room, right down the center of the room. But even though there's just James and I, 
we do put this table to use every single day by the fact that we use it to prepare meals on. We also work a lot at this table. Um, I do my artwork here often, especially in the winter when it's the only warm room in the house. And James does a lot of his studying at this table as well, his studying and writing. Let me tell you about our very odd floor. The floor had been sinking for years, and we knew that it was having problems. And one Christmas Eve, we didn't have any plans. We didn't have any plans for Christmas. We decided out of the blue that we'd rip up the old floor. And we proceeded on Christmas Eve to rip up the entire floor in this room. All the joists came out. We replaced everything. It took us, uh, ended up taking us about two weeks. And then we put in fresh insulation. I mean, the whole thing uh, just completely redid the whole floor, which now elephants could dance on it and nothing would happen. It wouldn't even crack. So that's nice to know. But we redid the whole floor and then we covered it with this OSB board. And then we just couldn't determine what we wanted to put on top of that. The idea was either oh, wooden flooring that we had uh, res resuscitated from another project. What I really wanted in here was cobblestone. But for a long time, we just couldn't decide what to put in here. And I was so tired of just walking on OSB board for almost a year. And one day I just said, okay, I can't stand the floor anymore. I'm going to go in there and do something to it. And so I ended up putting several coats of sort of a golden paint on it. Oh, I want you to know that you're probably seeing this in a very bright yellow, but the room really, none of the yellow in this room is as bright as it's going to appear on film. But anyway, I put several coats of a floor enamel on it, and then I just did the stencil, and then I went over it with about four coats of polyurethane. And you know what? I love this floor. I love this very simple floor. I think it took me about um, three days to do the stenciling and the drying and all in between. And now I'm just thrilled with it, and I may, may keep it for a very long time. I, I took a few liberties in designing these glass front deep drawers because the front glass is simply so that I can see what I've got and grab it pretty quickly if I want one of these vintage tools. I don't use all of them. If it's incredibly rusty, there's no way that I'm going to use it, but um, most of them are in pretty good shape. So these are pretty shallow as far as a glass front goes. Let me show you. Enough to be able to get my utensils in, but then behind that they're very deep, deep drawers in which you can keep your modern equipment, <laughs> which is the stuff my husband uses. I can easily see where the utensil is if I need to get it, but it also makes kind of an interesting vintage display. This wonderful old wash tub has been with me for a long time and it's actually a great little piece of furniture to be used as a table. But it's also great for storage because the lift, the lid lifts up right here. This is where the homemaker would have put the soiled clothing, the water, and the soap. And then in that little hole right there would have been a dasher and she would churn the clothes up and down, back and forth with that dasher. And then after a amount of time where the clothes would have gotten clean, she would drain the soiled water out of this little drainage hole right here. And then the sopping wet clothes would be put through a wringer, such as this one. And I like this ringer. It was given to me as a birthday gift when I was about 24 years old. My best friend gave me this ringer. I don't know very many 24-year-olds these days that would want a washing machine ringer for their birthday. <laughs> but I was absolutely thrilled to get it. 
Just about does it for our kitchen tour for the day. I just want to show you a few more items in the kitchen, including this. My favorite piece of copper in the kitchen is this majestic tea kettle. And I love it because it's got a history behind it. The Majestic Stove Company began making stoves in the late 1800s, and they made them all the way up into uh, maybe the 30s or the 40s. But at the time that this kettle was made, probably early 1900s, if you purchased a Majestic Stove, you had the choice of either this free kettle to go with your stove or a cast iron pan. I definitely would have chosen this kettle. And in fact, I do have it. don't have a uh, Majestic Stove, but I love this kettle that I used this morning. This is a Manning and Bowman 1917 electric coffee percolator and the little toaster is 1930s Art Deco toaster. You can get them a lot fancier than this too. I've seen some really really pretty ones online and this was made by Landers and Frary. Now I was going to go ahead and do some gardening videos but this video is getting too long so this week we'll have two videos. The other one will be outside. But right now I want to go upstairs and I want to go into the studio and show you that piece of artwork that I was talking about. The Good Earth. How bountiful is the Good Earth? If you've watched my videos for any length of time you know that I make my living as a freelance artist. I don't often promote my own work. I promote a lot of work for other people. I promote other books and other authors and teas and coffees and, and all sorts of dinnerware. And I don't get paid for any of that. I simply share them with you because they're products and people and things that I believe in. But I think it's about time that I started doing a little bit of self-promotion and giving myself a few shameless plugs simply because of the crazy year of 2020. We have had all of our art shows canceled so far and I'm going to have to make more of an effort of selling my products off my website and online. So today I just want to introduce you to one of my favorite favorite pieces. So today I want to introduce you to an offset lithograph 16 by 20 print of a paper cutting that I did back in 1998, I believe is what it says on this piece. And this is simply a print. The original was sold a long time ago, but I still offer the print for sale. And that's probably because it's a print that I always have loved. And it represents family, farm, gardening, heritage, all the things that I love in my life. And the center poem or rhyme was something I just found author unknown in an old book for rain and snow and sun of seasons for bounty given throughout the year and bins heaped high with harvest cheer for blazing sun and pouring rain that beat upon the golden grain and work within the sheaves of wheat to give us tasty bread to eat for fleecy clouds and skies of blue for all earth's beauty ever new and all the joys that are to be we offer thanks, O Lord, to thee. How Bountiful is the Good Earth it was originally a painted paper cutting. And I am going to show you very briefly how a painter pa painted paper cutting is done so that you can have a little more appreciation of what this piece or how this piece was created. What do I mean by paper cutting? Most people are familiar with this style of paper cutting, which is also known by the German and Swiss names Schirrenschnitt. It uh, is basically translates as scissors snipping or scissors cutting. And this is an art form that I have been doing since the 1980s. And I generally don't do the black paper cutting. Every once in a while I do. I was more focused on painted paper cutting, which is more of a Pennsylvania Dutch style of paper cutting. Let me show you how those are done. Generally speaking, to make a painted paper cutting, what I do is I start with a piece of parchment paper. And then I place, begin to make a freehand drawing on the paper, as you can see here in the center. And then I begin with small scissors and blades to actually cut out the design. This is a very tedious process and one that requires a lot of patience. Paper cutting or a Scherenschnitt could be a mirror image such as this one is. So 
sort of like a lacy valentine. In fact, many of them were used as valentines. This one is a pretty intricate design, but until you paint it, it doesn't really come alive. And once you do paint it, and my painting choice was watercolor on the parchment paper. So this is a complete paper cutting, but it's never really quite as beautiful until you actually paint the piece. I have a painted paper cutting, or a painted Schirrenschnitte, which I completed well, quite a few years ago. And after it's been painted with watercolor, the details have been filled in. Then it's mounted on the black board, and the black is what really brings out the contrast in the painting and really makes it come alive. That's why when you look at one of my prints and you see a black background, it's because the original was a painted paper cutting placed upon a black background. So this is more of a folk art style, and this is one that I never made a print of. So now that you've seen how a paper cutting is made, it probably makes a little more sense when you look at the black background on this piece, which is, as I said, this is not the original. This is a print of the original. Honestly, I don't know who has the original. I sold it quite a long time ago. But I've chosen this piece for this particular time of the year because a lot of people are harvesting their gardens, their potagers, you're pulling your bounty out, you're baking pies, and you're canning and making preserves. And this is just a really nostalgic and homey piece of art. So if you're interested in anything like this, just check it out on my website at uh, jerrylanders.com. I'll put a link in the description. Thank, well, thank you very much for joining me on the kitchen tour. Several people have asked for it, and I just hope that yellow didn't knock you out too much. The cabinets are not really as bright yellow as they appear to be in the video. I will have a gardening video up next week. I just didn't want to make this one much longer than it already was, but I've already got all the video recorded for a cold frame out in the garden and one of my favorite little cute flowers. So that'll be... Uh, coming up in a few days. Thanks for coming along. This is Jerry. See you later.